Awesome. Hey, a couple of weeks ago, I spoke a message called The Best You. How many of you were here for that? If you weren't here for that, please dial into the podcast or, or even better, get onto YouTube. It's on YouTube because I tend to use props these days and it makes no sense of the podcast, what I'm doing, right? Because you can't see. Uh, but why don't you turn to someone tonight and say, things are about to get real. Things are about to get real. We're going to uh, get into Yen Tan. What are you doing at church on a Sunday night? Ridiculous. Things are about to get real. Yen Tan's in the house. How awesome is Jardina Johnson? That's phenomenal women of God we're raising in the house. Some people still hating on me for raising women on the platform. I just say, well, just too bad, so sad. God loves his sons and his daughters. Uh, we, we're going to drop in in the Old Testament of a central Old Testament figure by the name of Abraham. How many of you have heard of Abraham? When we introduced Abraham in the book of Genesis, Abraham's married to Sarah and they, uh, for their whole married life, uh, have been desiring to have children. They were unable to conceive. And so we, we see this account of God having a conversation with Abraham, who was formerly called Abram, and Sarah was formerly called Sarai. God changed their names. And God interrupts this older man that we, that we introduced to. He's in his uh, late 80s and, and uh, has a conversation with him and talks to him about his future, begins to speak to him, has a conversation to him about his heart for this man. Abraham. We pick up this account in Genesis 15, reading from verse 5. It says, Then he, being God, brought him, Abraham, outside. Pulls him out of a tent one night, right? How many of you don't like to be interrupted while you're sleeping? God sometimes likes to do that to us. Interrupts Abraham from his sleep, pulls him outside and says, Abraham, I want you to look up into that clear Israelite sky. And I want you to put your eyes on that and count the stars if you're able to number them clearly. No one can count stars, right? It's an impossible task. And he said, I mean, God said to Abraham, that's what your descendants are going to be like, as numerous as the stars in the sky. What a crazy thing to say to a man and his wife who'd been struggling to have children and now well past childbearing age. How many of you have ever been in a place in your life where you feel like what God has placed in your heart, what He's promised you, things that you've read out of the Word of God, things that you've heard preachers say, things that people have prayed over you that seem so far-fetched, so far ahead, so far out of the league of your present reality. It can be deflating at times. And, 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 and as we begin to read Genesis 15 onwards, we begin to see that it was deflating. And his wife, Sarah, in, even in her own heart, and Abraham decided that, yes, that's your promise, God. But, but it, we, we, you just don't understand. We've been trying our whole married life to have children, and we are well past childbearing age. And so Sarah concocts a plan to help God out a little bit. How many of you ever tried to help God out? Do you know what I mean? Like as if God's a bit incompetent. So you're trying to help him out a bit, trying to make things happen a little. Now, I'm no expert on women, but I certainly have never met a wife who's willingly offered up a younger, better looking version of herself to her husband to sleep with. But this is what Sarah did. She said, it's not going to happen, Abraham, but what I do have is a handmaiden. And maybe for what God has promised for our descendants to number like that, which you see in the sky to actually happen, maybe the only way for that to happen is that you need to sleep with my handmaiden, Hagar. I don't know about you, but insecurity and our deepest pains often make us do things that are completely out of character. Because if you think about the journey of infertility, for those of you that know this, this, this conversation that God is having with Abraham, the Bible tells us that Abraham and Sarah were not able to have kids, but I think Sarah knew that the problem of barrenness was in her body, not in Abraham's. Because the Bible tells us that one night with Hagar and she conceived a child, nothing wrong with the old boy. You know what I'm saying? He's still got it going on. Maybe Sarah knew that the inability to have children was in her own body. The Bible tells us that Hagar conceived of Ishmael after one night with Abraham. Ishmael was born and as he grew up, in the house with Sarah, the Bible says that Sarah despised Hagar and Ishmael in her heart. How many of you know that sometimes we become the victims of someone else's pain? 
that people project their toxicity on us. It ain't got nothing to do with us, but it's, it's actually a reflection of the inner pain that's going on on the inside of them. And Sarah projects that kind of pain onto Hagar and Ishmael, and she drives them away. And so here is Abraham having made a poor decision to, uh, Abraham and Sarah having made a poor decision to, to cut corners, to manipulate and control a situation to birth an Ishmael that was never part of God's plan. But two chapters later, God begins to revisit the same conversation that he has, that he had with Abraham before Abraham and Sarah made the mistake. And he begins to remind them of a promise that has not been disqualified out of their lives in spite of the mistakes they made. How many of you are so glad that we serve a God of the second chance? How many of you are so glad that God does not hold his promises, withhold his promises against us when we've made a mistake, but his promises are irrevocable. His intent for our lives are irrevocable. In Genesis chapter uh, uh, 17, it says, Abraham fell face down and God said to him, as for me, this is my covenant with you. In other words, Abraham, let me remind you, nothing's changed. You will be the father of many nations. No longer will you be called Abram. Your name will be Abraham. For I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you very fruitful. I will make nations of you and kings will come from you. God also said to Abraham, as for Sarai, your wife, you are no longer to call her Sarai. Her name will be Sarah. I will bless her and I will surely give you a son by her. I will bless her so that she will be the mother of nations. Hold up a second. This is a woman that offered her handmaiden as an affair of an op- option of an affair to her husband. Epic mistake. And yet God is saying, I count that against you no longer, Sarah. I'm still calling you blessed. Thank God. God is merciful. Thank God He continues to see us for who we could be, not who we were. Abraham felt fast. Uh, it says that uh, I will bless her so that she will be the mother of nations. King, kings of peoples will come from her. Verse 17. Abraham fell face down. He laughed and said to himself, will a son be born to a man a hundred years old? Will Sarah bear a child at the age of 90? And Abraham said to God, if only Ishmael might live under your blessing. Things are about to get real. I want to speak to you tonight on what do you say to yourself? What do you say to yourself? We read Genesis chapter 17, and there are actually two conversations happening here. If you put that slide up for me, Genesis chapter 17. It says, Abram fell face down, and God said to Abraham, God is having a conversation with Abraham. As for me, this is my covenant with you. You will be the father of many nations. Just 13 verses later, Abraham fell face down yet again, but he laughed, and this time it's a second conversation. He is talking to himself. He said this, will a son be born to a man 100 years old? Will Sarah bear a child at the age of 90? I want to submit to you tonight that the most destiny-defying conversations are not the ones God is having with you. They are the ones that you're having with yourself. The most destiny-defying, future-shaping conversations are not the ones that God is having with you daily through the Word, through the Bible, through, through the encounter, through the altar call. The most destiny-shaping ones are the conversations you're having with yourself in the quiet of your own heart. Here is God and He's clearly spoken about covenant and fruitfulness and kings and nations coming out of you. I'll call Sarah blessed. But it was the conversation that Abraham was having with himself that questioned the validity of what God said. What we say to ourselves in the quiet contemplation. You notice how Abraham fell face down, God had a conversation with him. Abraham fell face down, he had a conversation with with himself. Quiet contemplation looks the same regardless of whether God is speaking to you or you're talking rubbish to yourself. It still looks like quiet contemplation. My question to you is what are you saying in the quiet of your own heart when no one's listening? Because what we say to ourselves is not stuff we put on social media necessarily. It's not the inspirational quotes and memes that we put up on, 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 on Instagram. Come on, are you out there? Well, some of us actually do, but you know, that's oversharing, but most of us stay classy around that space. But what we say to ourselves is what we really believe about what is going on in our worlds. What we say to ourselves in the quiet of our own heart is what we really believe about ourselves. What we say to ourselves about other people is really what we truly think of them. What we say to ourselves can often change what is an initial God conversation, change it from divine to 13 verses later, completely carnal. This was what was happening with Abraham. God's voice speaks to us through either through Scripture or through an encounter or through the impressions of the Holy Spirit. And in the quiet of my own heart, there is always a secondary conversation. 
I'm about to get real with you guys. This has been, this has been my journey, like Rick. It's been my journey for, for many, many years. That it, it's, it's not the conversations that I've been having with God at Prophesy Conference or in my daily devotions that have limited me at times. It's a subsequent conversation I have with myself after God's spoken to me that's limited me at times. If you think about the voice of God and what He says to you about your life and about your circumstance and about your situation, and you think about the self-talk voice, they're two very different things. And this is what I've learned over the years that is going to free you and it's going to help you. Can I share this with you? The, re- the way that you know a voice being the voice of God is because when God speaks, He will only ever say things to you that you could have never come up with yourself. That's why it always seems like God says some ridiculous things. Because when God speaks, He'll only ever speak to you about things that you could never have dreamed of coming up with yourself. God will never speak to you about changing your outfit because you can tell yourself to do that yourself. God, can't, God doesn't need to speak to you about going to have a shower because you can just tell yourself, I need to have a shower. Right? It's the voice of God because God will only ever speak to you about things that you would have never come up with yourself. Only God would speak to a hundred-year-old man who had a 90-year-old wife to say, come out of your tent, have a look at the stars in the sky, so shall your descendants. Only God could come up with that. If I was God, now you should, oh, you ought to be grateful I'm not. But if I was God, I would like talk to like a 30-year-old dude with a 28-year-old wife and they've had like four or five sons, right? I would talk to a Craig and Teresa Hunter. Do you know what I'm saying? They already, they, they, they already got the sons. Like, you just might as well. That makes sense. That makes sense. Why would you talk to a hundred-year-old man and tell him that he's going to bear a son? What ridiculous conversation to have. Only Jesus would stand on water in a storm, call out to a guy in a perfectly functioning boat. Come. What? No one would think to say that. If I was Jesus, thank God I'm not. It would make sense to say, Peter, it's a bit hairy and stormy out here. Stay in the boat. I'm coming to you. That would make sense. Only God would speak to an ex-murderer on the run from Egypt and talk to him out of a bush that's burning. What? Who comes up with that? To say, Moses, go back to the place of your former pain and tell the king of Egypt, to let his entire labor force go. All his GDP is just going to walk out the door. His entire economy is just going to exit. Just tell him. What? Who comes up with that? Only God would speak to a butler, a cupbearer, who knows nothing about anything about building, to go back to the place of his ancestors' birth to rebuild ruined walls. You know it's the voice of God because you would never come up with it yourself. And so if God has spoken to you something that just sounds ridiculous, you can count on it that God has spoken. If it's not achievable in your own strength, if it's not achievable outside of faith, if it's not achievable, come on, are you out there? If it's not achievable, uh, you know, just, just by trying to figure it out yourself, you can bet your bottom dollar that God has spoken because God will only ever speak to you about what is possible. But it's the subsequent conversation that we have that is destiny defining. It's not what God has said to us. It's what we say after God has spoken to us. It's where the rubber meets the road. And for me, that subsequent voice, that voice of self-talk, is often the voice of doubt. For some people, it's the voice of fear. For some people, it's the voice of anxiety. For some people, it's the voice of worry. For some people, it's the voice of unbelief. For me, it's the voice of doubt. How many of you have had things that you say to yourself and upon reflection is the voice of doubt. Come on, am I alone in the room or are there some people? And this is what I've learned about the voice of doubt. The voice of doubt is a master of disguise. He is a master of disguise. The voice of doubt always masquerades as the voice of wisdom. The voice of logic. The voice of reason. The voice of it all makes sense. The voice of careful, careful, think about that a little bit more. This is how you, I'm not asking you to ignore the true voice of wisdom, but I'm asking you to identify the master of disguise. 
Because the true voice of wisdom will never tell you to not do something God has already asked you to do. But this is the kind of conversations we always have. God speaks to us about something, about leading a connect or, or going on that missions trip and, or, or enrolling for Nations College. And we feel that in God. And bam, we sense God. I, I've been in ministry a really long time and I can see it. Two weeks later, uh, I need to pray about that a little bit more. Pray about what? Oh, I, I need to make a wise decision. It's not the voice of wisdom. It's the voice of doubt. The true voice of wisdom will never tell you to not do what God has already. Come on, are you out there? The true voice of wisdom will only ever give you an unfolding strategy on how to achieve what God has already asked you to do. Come on, are you out there? But for me, the, the, the voice of doubt, the voice of doubt, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a master of disguise. The Israelite nation to which God had, had spoken to Moses about pulling them out of Egypt, out of slavery, had an opportunity to see their future. I don't know about you, but I sometimes fantasize about being able to travel in time and see the future. How many of you want to do that? Like, you want to say, I, like to, I want to know what I look like when I'm old. And then they come up with a face app. I was really disappointed. <laughs> Chrissy actually did that app on my face, and you don't even want to know about it. <laughs> Mr. Miyagi, she called me. <laughs> you guys are too young to know who that is. Wax on, wax off. But God had promised for generations, I've got this land for you to occupy. It's flowing with milk and honey. That's where your tribes are going to settle. You're going to have an identity again. Slavery is going to be way part of your past. And so what the Israelite nation did when they came out of slavery is that they, they sent spies to literally go and taste, go and see, going to bring back evidence of this thing that God had already promised. A foregone conclusion, right? But this is what it says in Numbers chapter 13, verse 31. But the men who had gone up with him, being Caleb and Joshua, who were two out of the 12 spies, said this, we can't attack those people. They are stronger than we are. And they spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land they had explored. They said, the land we explored devours those living in it. All the people we saw there are of great size. We saw the Nephilim there. The descendants of Anak came from the Nephilim. It says this, we seem like grasshoppers in our own eyes, and we looked the same to them. This was not a conversation God was having with them. This was a conversation they were having with themselves. God did not have this conversation with them. This was a conversation of self-doubt, the self-talk that had come after God had given them the promise. This is what you need to catch, right? Your self-talk voice will often look for other people with a similar self-talk voice to validate what you've just said to yourself after God's spoken to you. You always look for, for other people to, to, to validate what you've already talked yourself out of doing in God. I'm not going to talk to this side because this side is going to agree with me. Come on. It's part of our human nature that, that we kind of polarize toward other people that have the similar self-talk voice. We kind of buddy up with them. You know what I'm saying? We kind of all text each other. We kind of start this WhatsApp thread because we all kind of group together. This was what was happening to the 12 spies. The 10 of them came and they kind of, their self-talk voice started to talk to each other. And, and you know that from this point, what should have been only a few days walk to the promised land, ended up being 40 years in the wilderness because of their self-talk of what they said to themselves after God had already promised them. Let them taste it. They even brought back the grapes that were the size of watermelons. Crazy. They tasted it. We tasted it. It's true. It's all there. I wonder how many of us in spaces and areas and parts of our lives that we've been wandering around the wilderness for years, still walking with God, because they still walk with God in the wilderness, but going nowhere fast because of what we said to ourselves constantly. For years, for me, God has spoken to me about my identity, about how valued I am, about, about how loved and, and, and how accepted I am as a man. And there have been years where I've looked my, at myself in the mirror and told myself, you're not like your brother. He's so much more smarter than you. He's more successful than you. You'll never be like him. You'll never measure up. And for years, it's kept me in a cage. It's time for me to stop talking to myself like that and start talking to myself the way Jesus. Come on, are you out there? I wonder if there's people here. Maybe you've been journeying. You've been journeying 
in the wilderness for years over an era in your life where you know that God has said that I am the God who heals you. Come on, are you out there? It's in the Word of God that He's healed all of my diseases. By your stripes, I am healed. You know that, but then when you look at yourself, you go, well, well cancer's been in my family. I, I, I think I should just manage that. You know that God has told you that God has not given you a spirit of fear, but of love and of power and of a sound mind. And you know that that has been spoken over your life. And then when you look at yourself in the mirror, your self-talk is, well, mental illness has been part of my family for four generations. Maybe I just need to change my prescription. Maybe I just need to get better pills. Come on, maybe, just maybe, for too long, God is wanting to uncage Christians from the wilderness walk. Because of the language and the conversations that we're having, we're having with ourselves, it's time for us to change what we say to ourselves to make it align with what God says about our lives. I need a resounding amen from the 6 p.m. service. What we say to ourselves about ourselves is one thing. But how many of you know sometimes we can limit the fruitfulness, the joy, the fulfillment, the fullness of our lives? relationally because of what we say to ourselves about other people. God said to Abraham, way after he's made his mistakes and, and he slept with Hagar, God revisits the covenant with him. I'll make you fruitful. I'm going to make nations come out of you. I want the kings are going to come from your lineage. As for your wife, Sarah, I will bless her. I will make nations come out of her. Kings will come out of her lineage. And yet Abraham fell face down and said, will Sarah bear a child at the age of 90? We see it time and time again. But God speaks over the people in our world. And yet what we say about them is so different to what God says about them. We see it with husbands and wives. I don't know if Juddy's here tonight. Is Juddy here tonight? He's gone back. But I'm going to pick on, Sarah, oh, on, on Clara tonight. Imagine if I, if I come up to Clara and say, Clara, Juddy is awesome. He's such a great guy. He's such an amazing man of God. When he prayed for me, oh my goodness, I encountered Jesus. And Clara, the, oh, you don't have to live with him. <laughs> is that? Come on. We talk about people like that to ourselves. We would never say it. It's like the wife that comes home and says, honey, honey, you, you would not believe it. Pastor Rick asked me to take on a connect group and I really feel like it's in God. It's such great timing. The kids have grown up a little bit and the husband thinks, oh man, Rick clearly hasn't seen your mood swings. Oh man, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think you'll be good. <laughs> See, what we say to ourselves about others has the potential to abort the full fruitfulness of why that person is in your world. The covenant that God had made with Abraham was unable to be fulfilled without Sarah's part in it as well. God required Abraham to not just change his speech about himself, but to change his speech about his own wife. It's time for us to change what we say to ourselves about ourselves, but also what we say to ourselves about other people. Imagine if the church literally only talks to ourselves about ourselves and each other purely based on who God says we are. Think about all the things that you've said about yourself in the past. There are not. Think about some of the things you say to yourself about other people. This is how you know it's not God, because God would never say that about them. God would never say that about them the way you talk about them. God would never say those things about you the way you talk to yourself in the mirror. He would never say that. He would never say that about your chronic illness like that. He would never tell you there is no hope with your mental illness. He'll never say that about your relational status, that you'll never find love, that you're always broken. He'll never say that about you. It's time to realign what we say to ourselves, about ourselves and about others, back to who he, come on, I need a resounding amen from the church. You guys getting something out of this? I love David in the Bible, King David. He was amazing. He was, it's like when you read the Psalms, he's like giving us a masterclass, a template, of how to align what we say to ourselves with the Word of God. We see in Psalm 103, a time in David's life where he was at the height of his powers, but at the lowest point, one of the lowest points in his life. He had a lot of low points, but this was, was particularly a low point for him. David was king. He was at the height of his powers, but he'd just come out of an incident where he'd seen a woman bathe in the nude on a rooftop across the, the, the way from his palace window. He lusts after her. He conspires to have an affair with her. 
cut a long story short, he actually has an affair with her and then conspires to cover up that affair by putting her husband in the front line of battle in order to ensure that he had every possible chance of getting killed in battle. Make sense to you guys? And so now, Uriah, her husband, was actually killed in battle and he is guilty not just of having an affair but also conspiring to commit murder. So the prophet Nathan comes to him and exposes his sin and is in that place that he's feeling not just repentant but also condemned and guilty and carrying the burden. He, the Bible says that he, he put sackcloth and ashes, which is the way that Jewish people would mourn and, and grieve and, 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 and pay penance, if, if, if you know what I'm talking about, right? So he was in that really low place. How many of you have been in that place where you find that it's so hard even just to get out of bed some mornings? Well, David was actually in that place. I don't know about you, but you could forgive him for wanting to be depressed and be in a state of depression. But David masterclassed how to align what you say to yourself to avert those things and to bring your heart back toward God. And he writes this, bless the Lord, church. Does he say that? No, worship leaders do that. <laughs> praise him, church. We're good at telling people how to praise. But David is saying, bless the Lord, O my soul. And all that is within me, David, come on, bless his holy name. I'm feeling low right now, but I'm going to tell myself to bless the Lord on my soul. And come on, David, don't you forget all his benefits. Come on. He's telling himself to realign his self-talk back to the God who saved him from the miry clay. Back when he was in, the, in harm's way with the lion and the bear as a shepherd boy, when he was facing Goliath, when he was being chased like an animal in the cave, he's realigning his life at his lowest point back to a God who says who he says he is. I need a resounding amen from you. Turn to someone and say, it's time to give yourself a good talking to. A good talking to. That word good in the Hebrew is tob, meaning all that is divine and all that is in God. It's time to give yourself a good talking to. It's time to talk to yourself the way God would speak to you. I love this account in uh, the book of Mark, in the Gospels, it accounts for a woman that I think is just a legend. She is an inspiration to me. This woman, we don't know her name. She is nameless. She is faceless. But this woman is legit. She's a legend. The Bible doesn't tell us really much about her history, but the Gospel writers go to great lengths to tell us about her condition. To the early hearers, just knowing her condition contextualizes her life. So we immediately have a picture as to the kind of life she's leading. The Bible tells us that for 12 years she'd been bleeding. She'd been bleeding menstrually. So she was unable to stop that bleeding. So not just a lot of pain and discomfort, but, but you, you, you can be certain that she was living in a time in human history where it's fair to say that there were not very many medical advances in women's reproductive health. You know what I'm saying? Doctors really didn't know what to do with her. It says here in Mark chapter 5, Now a certain woman had a flow of blood for 12 years and had suffered many things from many physicians. You can only imagine back in those days the kind of weird potions and things that they would have tried and given her and the kind of side effects she would have suffered through all of those years of not getting well. It says she had spent all that she had, so she was broke. And I'm going to explain that to you in a minute. It was highly unlikely she was ever able to get work suffering from the condition that she had suffered. So she had spent all that she had and was no better, but rather grew worse. This woman was in a dire situation, friends. You could be excused for being in the pit of despair because what this woman was going through was not just a physical limitation. It had great social and emotional baggage attached to it. In Jewish culture, if you were bleeding menstrually, you were considered ceremonially unclean. So people were not allowed to interact with you. And so here is this woman. She's not just feeling the physical pain and discomfort of, of her condition. And it was getting worse. As it says, she's broke. She's got no money. But she would have also had to live for 12 years with the stigma of being unclean. So it is fair to say that she had lived for 12 years up until this point in complete isolation. This is not a woman that had a husband and kids to talk to and a connect group. Come on. It's not a normal functioning life that many of you in this room have. She would have lived in complete isolation. I would probably submit to you as well that her skin had not seen the light of day for 12 years. Cooped up in a house. Because societally, she would have not been allowed to simply walk through a marketplace. She would have been treated like a complete outcast. So you can imagine the kind of shame and stigma and label. 
And every time for 12 years when this woman had opened her mouth to speak, it would have not been to her husband, not been to a best mate in the house, not been to a connect group that gathered in her living room. It would have only ever been to herself. The only conversations that she would have had as a human being for 12 years would have only been the conversations she would have had to her own soul. So you can imagine what she would be saying to herself. Month after month, no improvement. In fact, getting worse. She's seeing her bank account empty and she's feeling sicker. The cramps are getting worse. She, some days she can barely get out of bed. All of that to know that no one wants anything to do with her. She's unclean. The word cursed is used a lot for people like that. So you can imagine the self-talk, the conversations that she's having with herself. Except this one day, she maybe peers through the curtain of her window. She's hearing the commotion of a large crowd walking down her street. She's hearing the word Jesus, 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 being of Jewish descent. She's probably saying to herself, could this be? the Messiah? Could this be the healer? Could this be the one who the prophet Isaiah has spoken that by his stripes I am healed? Come on. Could this possibly be the one who opened the scroll in his hometown and read out the Luke chapter 4 that the spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me for I have come to heal? Could this be the man? Could this be my... But you can, you can imagine the contention in her own soul about what she knows of who this Jesus could be versus 12 years of talking to that same voice that says, you are cursed. What do you think? This carpenter from Galilee is going to heal you? Not even the best doctors in Jerusalem can heal you. Get back in your box. You're not allowed to go out in public. Who do you think you are? You can imagine the kind of conversations. Come on, are you out there? But I love that this woman is a legit legend, man. So, so it, it says this in Mark 5, right? Verse 27. When she heard about Jesus, she came behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. It just looks like a one-liner in there. But knowing her life, you would have known what she had to go through to get to this point. She would have known, she wouldn't have known how to do her hair. It's been 12 years since she's been out. She probably would have agonized over what outfit do I wear? How do I manage the bleed? Come on. How, 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 how do I do this? I don't know how to do this. Uh, and, 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 and figuring out how to silence the voice that she's constantly been making friends with for the last 12 years. Come on, are you out there? But here is this woman, and it says this, a powerful line. It says, for she said. 12 years, who would she have been saying this to? Herself. She's living in complete isolation. For she said. If only I may touch his clothes, I shall be made well. That word well is sozo, meaning whole. If only I can touch his clothes, I'm going to get my wholeness today. And immediately the fountain of her blood was dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of the affliction. If you keep reading this passage of scripture, you see that Jesus actually stops and said, who touched me? I felt power. Leave me. If you understand who Jesus is, the Bible says that He is the holder of all power and all authority. So if the one who holds all power notices a power surge leaving Him, this woman was legit. Come on. Something was really happening in the supernatural realm. And so this woman draws power out of Jesus. Because she decided that day, 12 years of that same self-talk voice, I'm breaking up with you today. And I'm establishing a new conversation. This Jesus who's walking past my house today has the power to heal. But I can tell you what, the power of what she said to herself didn't just have profound effects for her own, her own sozo, her own wholeness. Read Mark chapter 6, one chapter later, it says this, wherever he, being Jesus, entered into villages, cities, or the country, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and begged him that they might just touch the hem of his garment. How would they know to do that? Because one woman decided, I'm going to break up with his self-talk voice today. He's coming down my street. I'm going to align what I say to myself with the Jesus who heals. And because of that, she opened the door for cities, villages, a nation to get their sozo. Crowds came because she normalized what it was to touch the hem of Jesus' garment. So many, the multitudes after that, I wonder if there's some people at the Myri 6 p.m. service tonight that would dare to change their self-talk. 
I wonder if there's people in this service tonight that would dare to break up with that old voice of self-condemnation, that old voice of limitation, that old voice of unbelief, that old voice of doubt. Maybe for the generations that would come after, maybe there's a village, maybe there's a city, maybe there's a country somewhere that is waiting for you to open the door of the alignment of what you say to yourself. Back with the Word of God. I need a resounding amen from a church tonight. Musos, you can join me. Little wonder, David in the Psalms always wrote stuff that modeled to us what it was like to align what we said back with the heart of God. David would pray things, write things down like in Psalm 19 verse 14, let the words of my mouth and the meditation, the quiet contemplation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. Isn't that beautiful? How many of you want that to be your prayer tonight? May it be acceptable. May the things I say in the quiet space of my heart, may it be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Psalm 141 says, Set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips. David understood the power of what it is to set a precedence for his life, to align what he said to himself with what God says about him. Can we give Jesus a big shout of praise? You got something out of that tonight? Come on, stand to your feet. Stand to your feet. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah, God loves you so much. You just need to know that God loves you so much. His entire agenda was to pull you out of the place in life that you may have been and into relationship with Him. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes just for a moment. Maybe you're here tonight and you're not understanding half of the things that are being said. But what you do know is that there's something stirring inside of you. You can't put a finger on it, but it's, you feel like your heart's beating in your chest. That's the Holy Spirit inviting you to make a decision to allow Him into your life. Who is the Holy Spirit? It is the presence of God. God wants you to be in relationship with Him and the only way that you can do that is to ask Jesus to forgive you of all that you've done and to become Lord and Savior of your life. Maybe you're here tonight and you know that you are far from God. But tonight you want to make a decision to come back to Him. To come back into the family of God. To walk with Jesus closely again. If you're here tonight and that's you, I want to say a prayer with you right where you're standing. And all that you need to do is just gesture to me by simply lifting your hand. Every head is bowed, every eye is closed. Only myself and a couple of leaders are watching. It takes great courage to make this decision. I already see one hand. Thank you, sir. Awesome. One right here, this gentleman in the red t-shirt. Who else wants to join this gentleman here? You want to say yes to Jesus or you want to come back to him? Is that you? I see another hand over there. <laughs> gentleman in the dark blue t-shirt. Anybody else who's going to join these two? Brave men. God loves you so much. Your life is going to change forever from this moment on. The Bible says, if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that He is Lord, you'll be saved. Bit of a strange word, I know, but that word saved is simply to be saved from a life that is separate from Him. Is there anybody else? See that hand over there as well. Three hands. Awesome, dude. On. We're a church family, so this is a safe place to all pray together. Can we support these guys? Yeah? Come on. Dear Lord Jesus, we thank you that you died and you rose again for me. And tonight, I ask you to forgive me of all of the things that I've done wrong and to wipe away my past and to give me a brand new future. Lord Jesus, I invite you into my life as my personal Lord and Savior. 
in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen, Amen, Amen. Awesome. Young man, God's got such a great plan for your life, man. You know, the enemy's tried to take you out in different times. No more. You're his. You belong to him now. You belong to him now. God loves you so much, man. There's something on your life. Some leader's going to come at the end of the service, speak with you, give you a Bible, pray with you a little bit too. And sir, over there, I see you too. God loves you so much, man. You got a brand new start. It's wiped clean. You're going to feel a weight's going to be lifted off you, man. It's going to be so awesome. Again, someone's going to come and pray with you and give you a Bible at the end of the service. Mary, 6 p.m., I just know that God wants to do something really special in you. I feel like I've done my job by delivering this message across all four services here at Myri today. But the ball is now in your court because I believe that God wants not just to do business with you, you need to say yes to doing business with Him. There is grace to change what we say to ourselves. God can literally remove the old language, literally like a divorce, divorce that old voice and reinstate his rightful voice back into our lives. First group of people today, you know that what you've been saying about your situation, it's been a bit like the Israelites, you know, you, 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 you've been talking down that situation, maybe in your family, or maybe in your finances, maybe about your marital status, maybe about the health in your body, but it's a situational thing. And what you've been saying to yourself about your situation, it's been a bit hopeless, a little bit, it's just a little bit not God. God is gonna change your language tonight. Second group of people, You've been saying things about yourself, your identity, who you are. That is not God. God would never say those things about you. God is going to change your language. Third group of people. You've been saying some things to yourself about people in your life. And because of that, that's actually hurt true fellowship, true friendship. You've had to keep people at an arm's length when they've actually been put in your world to bless your heart and you've been saying some things about yourself and often it's because of historical hurt historical offense things that have happened to you and you've written them off and you and and and, and even though you've seen them grow and progress on and there's a part of you that you say this to yourself about them oh, but you know they don't know what I know about them and that actually hurts your future ability to have blessing in friendships and relationships that will come back to really bless you you know understand what I'm saying this, this message, hear me, hear me, because there's a lot of you are young in this room. This message is going to uncage so many of you if you were to lean in and open up your heart. This is particularly close to the heart of God, this message, this theology is particularly close to the heart of God because God actually showed me there is nothing that breaks the heart of a father more than to say to his daughter every day, you're beautiful, I love you, only for that teenage daughter to shut the door of her room and look at the mirror and said, I'm ugly. I'm a loser. I'm hated by my dad. There is nothing that will break the heart of a father more than to every day say to his son, son, I'm so proud of you. Son, you're awesome. Son, you're doing so good. And for that son to shut the door of his room and tell himself, I'll never measure up. I'm a nobody. I'll never be any good. And that's what we do to God. This cuts to the very core of the theology of who our Heavenly Father. Do you understand this? Do you making sense to you? That's why it's so important. Then the enemy would like to keep this truth away from you. And the only way that you can dispel or counter the enemy's work of deception over your life in this area of what you say to yourself is to actually come and open your heart up to him and say, you will have no power over me anymore, enemy. I am going to say who I am that's in line with God. Come on, are you out there? And so if that's you tonight, step out of your seat. Come and do business with God. Begin to lift your hands. Come on, I want to pray with you. 